Welcome to the Nonprofit Show. We are so glad you're here. Today we have with us Diana Farias Heinrich joining us, and she is CEO of Abra Marketing. She's bringing to us a wonderful conversation, ethical storytelling using consent. So stay with us because Diana's got a lot of really good insight to share. If you haven't met us yet, we are so glad to meet you. Uh, Julia Patrick is here, of course, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd and CEO of The Raven Group. We together are so very honored to have the collective support of our amazing sponsors. So shout out of gratitude goes to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. Again, these companies have been with us many since day one, yeah. helped us to produce over 900 episodes, and here's where you can find them. So you can uh, scan the QR, download the app, and you can still find us on broadcast and podcast platforms. So again, really glad to have you joining us today. Diana, we are thrilled to have you here. Shout out to another friend of ours, uh, Cindy Wagman, that connected us and invited you know, us to, to make this connection so that we could have you on. So again, Diana has joined us, CEO of Aubra Marketing. Welcome to you. Hi, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here today. Well, we're excited to have you. Okay, let's back up and have you tell us what Abra means. Abra means there will be, and the idea is that there will be marketing, whether you are intentional about it or not, what you say or don't say says something about your organization. Yes. I, I love what you just said. What you say or what you don't say, it's going to, it's <laughs> moving train. This is a great, great lens for us to have this conversation because, you know, like one of my biggest create things that makes me crazy is um you know in marketing or when it, when somebody is asked a question by the media and they're like no comment it immediately makes you look guilty right i mean just the mm -hmm. whole, this whole concept of exactly it's keep going kids so <laughs> let's figure out how to work with this so exactly. you make my day i don't care what else you say <laughs> this is fabulous all right done here then <laughs> <laughs> our day is done have a good day um, <laughs> Let's start off with what is ethical storytelling? Um, we we bandy the word ethics about so much. Mm -hmm. And I think often we don't really even know what it means. It's just something that, you know, is over there in the back of our mind. So explain to us what this actually means. Yeah. So for me, ethical storytelling really started before I even knew what ethical storytelling was. So when I was a development and communications coordinator, one of my very first assignments was to write stories about these 10 young women who had won scholarships. And these were young women who were young moms, they had kids, they were graduating high school and going on to college. And so that's why they were getting scholarships. And so my job was to write their bios and their stories and to publish them online as all good nonprofits do to share the impact that they're making. So. I wrote the stories, I put them online, you know, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, the website, the email marketing, all of those sure. things, right? Sure. And um, we ended up with a really successful uh, luncheon, you know, with, with all of this content and um, promotion of these uh, young women's accomplishments. And so I felt really good about it because my mom was a young mother. And um, so I felt really good about, you know, essentially being a piece a part of these young women's stories and really getting to celebrate them. And so I published them and everything went really well. And then a few weeks later, I overheard some colleagues of mine mention one of the girls' names. And of course, my ear perked up because I got really familiar with them. Sure. And um, so I listened in and I overheard them saying that she had been um, in a domestic violence situation and her ex was being let out of jail. And so I'm an advocate for survivors of domestic violence. And I knew immediately that everything that I had posted about this young woman, first name, last name, her kid's name, the program location that she was in could lead her ex back to her. And I mean, I had this sinking feeling in my stomach, just like this black tar pit. And it just, you know, I, I made me think there has to be a better way to do this. 
-hmm. In the immediate aftermath, I did what I could to take back what I had posted. I took down the things off the website. You know, I took down, I went, I combed back through social media posts. Mm -hmm. I took down what I could. But one thing I always say is once you put something out there, it's out there. You can't yeah. control it. I couldn't take back emails. I couldn't take back things that people had shared. And so that left me with this feeling is there has to be a better way of doing this because I knew that if I had known what her situation was, I would have never published anything about her, right? We would have found a different way to celebrate her. Mm -hmm. And so that to me is what ethical storytelling is. Ethical storytelling is taking into account the client's experience before, during, and after the interview or the storytelling, right? To, to be able to find out what's going on with them and in their lives and taking that into account before publishing. Yeah. Mm. Well, Diana, thank you for sharing such a, a vulnerable story, right? Um, there's so many ways that could have gone. And again, I, I commend you for having that feeling in your gut, because I know for some people they'd be like, it's done. Like there's nothing else I can do. Right. But you really took that to heart um, as the advocate you are. So again, like just, just kudos to you. Many of us work with a very vulnerable population. Many of us work with, um, you know, individuals that we're just not completely sure of, of their stories. I I'm curious, you know, as you talk about this, you really are bringing that lens, um, which I too didn't know what ethical storytelling was until I found out. Right. But I I've done so many stories myself, kind of the same, yeah. but this is switching right from the donor centric to the client. So I'm really curious mm -hmm. how that move from donor centric to client centric has played a role, you know, in serving the community. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I mean, donor centric has its place and it's been around for a long time. Right. And it's um, what we're taught as marketing and communications folks to focus on so that we can bring in the funds. It has its purpose. It's making the donor the hero of the story. But I advocate ad advocate for clients to be the heroes of their own stories. Um, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going through the transformation. And if we're going from donor centric to client centric storytelling, it means that, yes, you're thinking about how the donor is going to receive the story, but you also have to think about how the client perceives their own story, right? And bringing that exactly. into the process of your storytelling and making sure that they are proud of what you're saying about them and that they know everything that's involved with sharing their story publicly. 100%. Julia, you know, we've talked about this a little bit before, you know, it's kind of the, the make them cry story oh, and yeah. many nonprofits, you yeah. know, use the clients themselves. We put yeah. them on stage. We put a light on them. Yeah. Diana, they're not always ready for that. And well, they, no. they mm -hmm. think they're ready, right? It's like, that. that is a very big moment. Can you talk mm -hmm. to us about how you see that? showing up in the community, pros and cons, perhaps. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I've seen this actually play out on st on several stages. Um, there's one instance where a young woman talked about, um, you know, she was talking about her story of, um, you know, not having a place to live for her and her daughter. And, you know, the, the organization that um, was providing housing to her asked her to share her story. So she goes up on stage and she shares her story. She's very proud of it. She's happy for herself and for her daughter that they, you know, have this place to live and she's grateful. And so she wants to do what she can to share her story. So she shares the story, but she wasn't told that it was going to be on Facebook Live. And so her partner at the time heard her say her story and the way that she presented him was a way that he didn't like being represented. And so that created problems for her in the aftermath. And unfortunately, that's what I've seen happen several times with clients who are asked to share their stories on stage where they're not taken through this uh, thought process of like, OK, are you sure you want to share this piece of your story? You don't have to share everything. Putting that no on the table and, and helping them think through like what happens um, in the aftermath and who's going to listen to this. And how are they going to feel and how's that going to make you feel right so that's kind of a piece of of training that's lacking um in in the nonprofit world yeah 
you know, I think this is what I'm such an advocate and it's a little bit more expensive, but in the long run, it saves you money um, of doing, you know, witness videos where somebody can, can witness what occurred to them, their story and their impact. And then there's time to edit it. There's time to reflect upon it. There's time to determine how this works and how this doesn't. Also, it's a lot less fearful than standing up on a stage, mm -hmm. no matter what you're doing, just standing up on a stage. I mean, not for Jarrett and I. <laughs> <laughs> there's moments. Yes, there's moments. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Is I think it's a, it's a lot, it's a more kind and more gentle approach to the process. And then you also have that content to, to repurpose and reuse. So it, it, it takes the story further. But I think that you are absolutely right to really look at, at how this impacts those around you and then to, to be viewed as somebody who's been involved in something that's really tough, mm -hmm. right? Because there are a lot of people that work really hard to put themselves in a different light and not have that label. And, and when you do this, that label is back out there. And so it's a really, really hard thing. Um, I want to kind of get into this a little bit more and ask you about, you know, the ethical storytelling best practices for some mm -hmm. of us that are, are like, wow, I never thought about this because I'm so working, working so hard on the event or <laughs> whatever. How does this go beyond what we're just trying to do in that ballroom or that at that luncheon? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, it protects the client's privacy and dignity. Um, it makes it so whatever you're putting out there is something that they can be proud of. So that let's say, you know, 10 years down the line, they're on LinkedIn and they're looking for a new job that if their name gets pulled up in a web search, that whatever that thing is, is that they shared 10 years ago. And that one part, that one chapter of their lives isn't going to come back to haunt them right in a negative way. Um, and the other, the other reason why it's important to implement, uh, ethical storytelling as a best practice is that it protects a nonprofit's reputation, right? Mm -hmm. If you, if you get a reputation for, for putting stories out there that, you know, are, uh, tear jerkers and, you know, cross right. lines, like that's the reputation that you're going to have, but it also is protecting nonprofits from potential lawsuits because as much as media release clauses give you permission to take a client's story or experience and share it, that doesn't actually protect you from them suing you. It kind of is like a forewarning, but they could still sue you, sure. you know, that's still possible. And, um, even organizations like save the children have experienced lawsuits like that. Yeah. Um, and so with ethical storytelling, the way that I approach it is to use um, a framework that I developed called informed consent conversations. So informed consent conversations really looks at things through a publishing lens. So there's four steps to it. The first step is to prep. That prep involves uh, knowing what you're going to be publishing, right? Is it going to be, for example, you know, the, the client speaking on stage or is it going to be a piece that you're going to share with your local, local news? Or is it going to be a piece that you're going to publish in your newsletter and on social media? It's really thinking through the end product and not just like the storytelling piece. Okay. Um, and it's also about vetting clients before you approach them for interviewing. So I always encourage uh, marketers, communications folks to... Um, make best friends with your direct service staff, the ones who are taking care of the clients directly because they know what's going on there. Um, and I was blessed to get to know a lot of clients be because of this approach, but there was still things that I didn't know about them. So one of my favorite things to ask, you know, a direct service person would be, um, is there anything that I should stay away from? Any subject, um, piece of their story that they're not ready to talk about because they may be ready to talk about one area of their life, but not the other. Right. So I wanted to know that sort of thing ahead of time. And then they would help me with recommendations. Oh, so-and-so has made really big strides. I think that they would be, you know, really proud to share their story at this time. 
The second step um, in informed consent conversations is actually conducting the interview. And this is essentially when a lot of communications folks get to meet the client for the first time, really like one-on-one. -on -one. So I really like to set the stage for like, this is who I am. This is what I do in the organization. Introducing myself first and like why I'm passionate about that organization so that they get to know me, right? And, and it's not just like, okay, here you go, sit down and start asking them a bunch of questions, like personal questions about their lives. Um, so it's really about helping them feel comfortable in, in the moment with you um, and not comfortable to like elicit, you know, um, any kind of like vulnerability, but just so that there is some level of trust there um, that you establish with them and that you're going to take care of them and throughout the process. Um, and so the other thing with um, conducting the interview is uh, to make sure that you put no on the table. And what that means is letting the client know that if at any point they change their mind about sharing their story mm -hmm. or any piece of their story, that they have every right to say no and they have every right to change their mind. No questions asked. Right. Mm -hmm. Um and so that's often like a really <laughs> I've gotten that reaction of like, really, I can say no. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You can say you don't have to share anything with me or with the organization or anyone for that matter. Um, but you can if you want to. Um, and so the third step is conducting what's called the stakeholder test. And this comes from um, the practicalities of informed consent and development photography. It's an article published by Save the Children. Uh, the author is Nabila Idris. And in it, she describes um, a stakeholder test essentially as putting the context of what you're publishing into the context of a client's real life. Mm -hmm. So like we were talking about earlier, yeah. um, if you're going to go up on stage and you're going to be on Facebook Live, your friends and family could watch that. How are you going to feel about that? How would they feel about what you said in this piece of your story, for example? Right. Or, you know, if you're going to publish an email newsletter, um, we're going to send out this email and it's going to go out to 2000 strangers. How do you feel about strangers knowing this piece of your story? Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> or even, you know, a lot of folks are are on social media. You know, if we make a short TikTok like about this and, you know, your friends see it, are you going to feel proud to be associated with our organization or might you feel a little bit embarrassed? Right. And that's where that prep work that you did in step number one really becomes essential because being able to truly get someone's informed consent is giving them all of that information ahead of time so that you can conduct this stakeholder test faithfully. And then the last step is to pass back the mic. So once the story is written or the video is done, right, I'm going to share it back with the client and I'm going to ask them, is there anything that you want to add, edit or delete? And remember that if you have if you've changed your mind, you can still say no to the whole thing and we'll scrap it. It is what it is. And it's happened to me. <laughs> I've had to scrap things and it hurts. Right. It yeah. hurts the communications person with all that like pressure. But at the same time, it's the right thing to do. Right. It's mm -hmm. the right thing to do. I have a total curveball question, Diana, because mm -hmm. I, I I've been in the sector long enough to know that I know often stories come out and are recycled. They're repurposed. Mm -hmm. They're, they're brought up years later. Sure. How might we address ethical storytelling if we're dipping back into what I'm going to call the vault, right? Like oh, yes. we're going back into this. So I'm really curious, how can we honor ethical storytelling in the future? If that, I don't know if I'm making sense, but essentially like no. how, give that person the ability to say no five years from now it's mm -hmm. a that's a great question that's a great question Jared because that's that's a true thing that occurs absolutely so I remember when I first started um there was a, a library essentially of some very you know five six year old stories right and that's what I had to work with at the time right. I didn't have anything new um, and I, I went to this presentation with a past CEO of Save the Children, and I asked this very same question. I was like, what do I do with it? Her recommendation to me was scrap the whole thing, delete it. That's what I was 
thinking. I, and I'm yeah. just really curious because I know many nonprofits and I, and I don't want to stop you from the rest of your answer. Uh -huh. We don't have a budget to do new stories every year, new videos, mm -hmm. new mm -hmm. photos, new everything. Right. So I know we're often going back to that vault, but to hear someone say, just scrap it, you know, like Ooh. that's powerful too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in doing the work, I've discovered that it really takes, um, you have to be really intentional about your storytelling rhythm um, mm -hmm. and have everybody be on board with it, right? You can't operate as, even if you're the one person that's doing communications in your organization, you can't operate by yourself when it comes to storytelling. You need the support of the direct service staff. You need to be able to have access to the client. You need support from your executive directors. Um, you know, you need to be able to um, access all of that background information. And so establishing a storytelling cadence so that everyone knows what to expect at every moment and so that everybody feels empowered to say, actually, this cadence is not working. Mm -hmm. It's not working for our clients. And that's where you bring in the client-centric storytelling again. If it's not working for your clients, then it can't work for you. You have to, you have to rethink it. Right. So yes, there's definitely like that, you know, we don't have the budget for this and we can't be reproducing, but it's important anyway to take the time to, to make sure that it's working for everyone and especially the clients. Right. At um, all, at all times, right. At really all times. Get that. Oh at my gosh, times. we could talk to you forever. And I want to, I want to honor our time, but before we sign off with you today, Mm -hmm. Talk to us about revolutionizing storytelling, how that's showing up and what does that mean? Yeah. So to me, revolutionizing storytelling really means that we're bringing diversity, equity and inclusion justice into the storytelling process. Mm -hmm. So we've brought at, at nonprofits as, as an industry have brought DEI into their programs, right, at every level. And we're really sophisticated in that area. But when it comes to communications, marketing, fundraising, it hasn't made its way there yet. Mm -hmm. And so that's what right. revolutionizing storytelling is. It's putting, it's doing that client-centric, community-centric type of fundraising and storytelling, bringing DEI into this space as well. And it really is about taking responsibility for the experience that people have with your organization when they share their story, not just when they're going through their through the programs. Um, and then and lastly, it's about changing the language that's used to refer to people, right? Because as soon as you put words like uh disadvantaged in front of something, you've already, you know, created an image of what a person is or isn't or what community is or isn't right so it's being really thoughtful about where you're placing your words and what words you're using because yes we do have to talk about the mission and the need and at the same time we have to make sure that we're not inadvertently perpetuating stereotypes that we're not trying to perpetuate right i think we need to be really careful about using the word victim mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and i think that we especially when you started off with domestic violence i mean that's really and an something that we we use these these words without thinking about it and and how it just um, never moves people along to a different point with which they might have achieved or they want to achieve. So, yeah, very very interesting. You know, um, this is my curveball question. Do you see this getting better, or do you see that you know it's not? people aren't understanding this. People are thinking that it's, we've got a job to do. We've got to raise money. We got to tell our story. And so this is more important than having this sensitivity and, and having this, this exercise. I love your four-step approach to this. Yeah. But do you see that, that that's something that the sector is ready for? I think that, you know, there's a momentum building around ethical storytelling. Um, once you talk about it, people are like, oh, light bulb moment, right? You understand it. And yes, it takes time. And it the thing is, is that this is the kind of thing that happens behind the scenes. So, you know, yeah. translating that into ROI for a nonprofit is really important. And that is definitely possible with some thought, um, with some effort put in behind it. And that's why it's really important for this to become a best practice, not just something that you do, you know, one time, but like that it's a best practice so that it survives the comings and goings of anyone in an organization. Once it's a best practice in one place, every other place is going to also want to make it a best practice. 
Yeah, one hundred percent. And I think about the longevity of our digital footprint nowadays, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. and you had mentioned you opened with this, you know, personal story of yours, Diana. And again, thank you. You know, there's um there's screenshots now. There's so many ways for people to uh, contain what was seen, even if we do our due diligence and go back in and delete some information, you know, like it's still been disseminated. It's still been seen. It's still been captured, I'm sure by someone. And so for us to really think through this, you know, kind of devil's advocate, it might take us a little bit longer to go through the processes, but as you said, it's the right thing to do. You know, it took me three years to develop this process. And, you know, I had colleagues for support. So if I was going to say, if you want to start this now, you know, I have resources available to help you, right? So that you don't have to take three years to start implementing this. That four-step process, you can start implementing that right away. Um, create a committee, get your, get your, you know, colleagues involved, have a lunch and learn, you know, there's very small things that you can do to get the ball rolling, right? The sooner you get it rolling, the sooner you're going to get it you know, you're going to get there. Get it figured yeah. out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think also just kind of getting the vocabulary right and letting everybody understand this is why we do it. This is where we're trying to move to um, so that we, you know, achieve our mission, vision and values. And we don't step back and create other problems for ourselves and for our clients. Mm-hmm. Well, this has been a fabulous conversation, Diana. I've really enjoyed it. Um, We need to have more conversations like this across our sector. And this is something that the nonprofit show really gets behind. Diana Farias Heinrich, CEO of Abra Marketing. And you're in Southern California, but you'll work everywhere. Or do you? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I'm blessed that my work can be done virtually. (laughs) Absolutely. We need your type of work, my friend. We really, really do. It's an incredible story. Um, to tell oftentimes with our nonprofits and we feel like this is what we want to do. And and this is such a buzzword right now, storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. And yet I don't think we really understand what it means or all that it takes to get through that arc of, of somebody's journey. So um, really great conversation. Hey, again, everybody, if we haven't met, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today by Jared R. Ransom, the nonprofit nerd. I like to call her my nonprofit nerd, but she can be your nonprofit nerd as well. And I also want to say thank you very much, Jared, while I was traveling and doing some speaking that you um, took care of everybody. I really, really appreciate it. Um, And our sponsors appreciate you too. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Nonprofit Tech Talk, Nonprofit Nerd, and Staffing Boutique. They're with us day in and day out as we march towards our 100th episode of the nonprofit show 1000th don't cut us oh, short. <laughs> you know i swear it's because it's like a hard thing to say the 100 was so long ago <laughs> oh long ago like four years ago but yeah 1000 oh my lord i need to like put that up in the studio like a like a little sticky that a ticker that, every day it just you know <laughs> turns it turns a new number <laughs> oh i can't even believe it Jarrett. that's crazy well Diana, remarkable words today um, that you shared with us and the sentiment, it was just amazing. And we need to really hear more of this conversation. So we will invite you back to get some more clarity on this. As we end every episode, we like to remind ourselves, our viewers, our guests, our listeners to stay well so you can do well. So you can tell that story. How about that? Mm -hmm. Ladies, thanks so much.